All right. Are you ready? Hi. Uh, I'm Carson, as you all know by this point. Uh, I'm here to talk about AYAB, often pronounced AYAB, but I still can't like get in the habit of that, about breathing new life into old knitting machines. Um, so first, a little about me. I'm a software engineer. I'm a full stack generalist, which means I've done a little bit of everything. Uh, front end, back end, Android, iOS, machine learning, community management, people management, bartending robots, wearable electronics. Um, <laughs> I've been machine knitting for about three or four years, and I jumped right into the deep end with AYAV. I didn't use any other patterning mechanism before that. And these days, I have a machine knitting YouTube channel, and I contribute to AYAV, which we'll get into in a bit. And I'm going to warn you all up front, this talk is very technical because I am an engineer first, but there will be time for questions at some point. This is one of the AYAB interfaces. AYAB is an open source hardware and software project to retrofit vintage brother knitting machines to be controlled by computer. Uh, this project was started about 11 years ago by two German engineers who reverse engineered the communication between the brother electronics and the machine itself and started publishing their code online. AYAB currently supports a number of the 900 series of standard gauge brother knitting machines. These are the electronic versions. <laughs> including the CK35, which was the semi-industrial um, brother knitting machine. It's got a motor and like a built-in color changer and can do all kinds of cool stuff, but they're hard to find. So the gauge of a machine is how far apart the needles are. On a standard gauge machine, they're 4.5 millimeters apart, and those machines work best with lace and fingering weight yarns. But coming in the next release will be support for the 270. This is the only electronic bulky machine that Brother ever made, and this has been a pet project of mine for a while. Bulkies are nine millimeters apart, and they work with yarn weights four and five. So I'm going to start by comparing AYAB to Design Init. Design Init is the other alternative for controlling your vintage knitting machine with a modern computer. AYAB is often compared to Design Init, but they are very different. Design Init helps you design whole garments and stitch patterns for those garments. AYAB only does the patterning. You load up an image, and AYAB will select the correct needles, and you do the rest yourself. Um, and you can do everything that the original machine could do, but you don't have any limitations on the width of your pattern or the height of your pattern. Um, and in addition, the software has a few different algorithms for sorting out multicolor jacquard and can handle up to six colors for you, and we'll get to that. So the Design Init software is going to run you about $330, and that's just the base software. And then it's a few hundred dollars more for special cables to connect your machine to your computer. The machines were made in the 80s and the 90s, and the connectors reflect that. Um, and the software only works on Windows, and you have to buy it from a human. So I've never actually used it, because I'm allergic to both of those things. <laughs> so the AYAB software is free, and the hardware should cost you less than $200. Um, why can we do that when Design Init costs so much? Because Design Init does a lot more, but AYAB is open source. There is no corporate entity behind AYAB. No one is making any money off of this. The code is up on GitHub, and anybody who wants to can take it and use it or make changes. And we have a group of core volunteers who fix bugs and add features. And that's how we do this. So Design Init requires special cables to connect to the like outside of your machine. AYAB has cables to connect to the inside of your machine. It connects directly to the internals which means that we can support older machines than Design Init does, and we can support machines where the original electronics no longer work. To install the hardware, you need to remove the machine's original electronics and connect the custom cables to our hardware. It's not destructive, so you can always put the original electronics back whenever you want. And the desktop software will split up an image into individual rows and send that information down to the custom hardware over USB. And then the hardware communicates with your machine sensors to select the correct needles. This is one version of the hardware. This is the shield. You can buy this as a kit on Etsy and then assemble it yourself if you're comfortable soldering. This goes on top of an Arduino. And then this is the interface that was uh, manufactured and distributed by Evil Mad Scientist. They no longer distribute these, but you can find them secondhand in some places. And then there's one guy in Germany who makes these. <laughs> uh, his contact information is at the end if you're interested. The hardware costs money while the software is free because there are humans sourcing parts and packaging them together, and they deserve to be paid for their time and energy. But if you really want to skip that step, all of the design files are up on our GitHub, and you can go and have your own manufactured. 
So let's talk about how all of this works. We have a desktop application. <laughs> yeah, this takes an image that you load and processes it, it breaks it down into individual rows for the patterning, that, the kind of patterning that you want to do, and then sends that line by line to the firmware on the Arduino. You're on your own designing these images, but we have a couple tutorials for how to do this on GIMP, which is an open source alternative to Photoshop. And now, the internals. Um, I'm going to go deep into the technical details because I just had to refactor a lot of this for the garter carriage, and it's important to me right now. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about how the original Brother firmware worked. So we have learned a lot from the Brother service manuals, which are very in-depth and very useful, and we've also reverse engineered a lot. So most of the images in these next few slides come from the 910 and the 930 service manuals. So let's start with the inputs. So in the Brother instruction manual, this is called the turn mark. It is actually a Hall effect sensor, so it can tell when a magnet is moving past it. And on the back of the carriage, there is a magnet. So when the magnet crosses the turn mark, we know where the carriage is on the bed. And the knit carriage has a north facing magnet and the, the Lace carriage has a south facing magnet, and we need to know which is which because the point at which the carriage does the patterning is at a different distance from the magnet on both carriages. So we can tell them apart when they cross the turn mark. Okay, there's also a sensor that tells us what direction the carriage is headed in, and then there's belt shift, but we'll get to that. And finally, the clock line. So during patterning, the carriage hooks into a timing belt on the back of the bed and it turns a rotary encoder inside the machine. And it produces what looks like a clock line. Um, if it, every time the carriage moves a whole needle, it corresponds to a full clock cycle up and then down. And this is all the information we get from the machine, and we need all of it to determine the output to write into the solenoid buffer, which is the only output we can give the machine. Um, and if you've ever taken apart a punch card machine, which I highly recommend, um, this should look pretty familiar because when Brother made the jump from punch cards to electronics, they just kind of slapped some solenoids in where the card reader used to be. Um, little linear actuators. So this is the solenoid buffer. It is only 16 bits. <laughs> this means that we can only write the pattern to the machine 16 bits at a time. So even though we know what all 200 stitches need to be, we can only tell the machine about 16 of them at a time. But it's not an arbitrary 16. It's a specific 16 in a repeating pattern across the bed. So if we set solenoid one to be selected, we're saying needle 100, 84, 68, and so on are also going to be selected. Then the machines are numbered from the middle out. So we start at one and then we go count up to 100 on either side. Yellow needles are on the left, green are on the right. So this is fine if you have a 16 stitch pattern and you're happy with the locations that it repeats in, but most people wanna do things more interesting than that. So the way that we deal with this limitation is by keeping track of where the carriage is on the bed and setting the needles and all updating the, the solenoid buffer a few needles ahead of the carriage. Because, but it's not quite that simple because it never is because of belt shift. <laughs> so while the solenoid buffer is 16 bits, the physical patterning mechanism underneath the machine bed can only manipulate eight stitches at a time. <laughs> Right, yes, so this is where belt shift comes in, and it's the sensor value that we get from the machine. And like, I feel the need to talk about this because there are all of two lines in the service manual about belt shift. And it's enough information for a service tech to understand what's going on and debug a machine, but like not enough for us to write the code. <laughs> and we had developed this like a communal understanding of what belt shift meant in the developer community. And it was, it was fundamentally wrong, but it was right enough that the other stuff still worked until I got to the point where I was adding support for a new kind of carriage that didn't fit into the specific specifications that the other two did and everything broke down. And I'm like, what is going on here? So <laughs> the point is, uh, this is my current understanding of belt shift. It's probably still wrong, but it's right enough that it's a good enough abstraction. I can get everything to work. So when the belt shift is normal, the first eight bits of the solenoid buffer are written to the machine. When the belt shift is shifted, the second eight bits are written to the machine. When we don't control this, the machine does. The value of belt shift changes every eight needles as the carriage moves across the bed. And we just need to do some calculations up front to figure out what the belt shift is going to be when the part patterning part of the carriage crosses the zeroth needle on the left side, well, the hundredth needle on the left side. Um, and we can extrapolate from there. And this changes from run to run because there are multiple ways that the carriage can fit into the timing belt on the back. And so 
if the belt shift is going to be shifted, is go, sorry, the belt shift is going to be normal when the carriage gets to that first needle, we can start writing the pattern into solenoid one. But if it's going to be shifted, then we need to start writing the pattern into solenoid nine. Um, and this creates interesting alignment issues with your pattern when you're debugging. So uh, these are a little blurry because of anti-aliasing, but um, your tuck and your slip and your fair aisle and your lace patterning works exactly the same way it would on an electronic machine or on a punch card machine as you'd expect, but double bed jacquard is a little different. So double bed jacquard is a technique for doing color work that has no floats. It uses the main bed and the ribber to create this really thick fabric that doesn't roll up the way that stockinet does and doesn't have any long strings on the back the way that Fair Isle would. And this is a banner that I knit for a demo booth at a convention. Um, ignore my messy workspace. <laughs> so let's go through the setup so we're all on the same page here and we understand the limitations. You attach your color changer. You can do this without a color changer, but it's much easier to do it with one. This is just an attachment that lets you easily switch between different yarns. Um, but the important thing to note here is that you can only change colors on one side of the bed. So you pick up one color and you have to knit two rows before you get back to the color changer to pick up the second color. And then the ribber goes to half pitch, so essentially knitting a full needle rib. And then brother ribbers are dumb, they don't do any patterning. But if you set them up correctly, then they will knit every other needle on the bottom bed. And then on the way back, they will knit the needles that didn't get knit on the way to the right. On the left, they'll lit the other needles. So that two passes of the carriage is equivalent to one row of knitting on the ripper. Okay, so for patterning, the main bed does patterning. And this is a punch card example of the way that you do, do double bed jacquard on a punch card machine. You'd have to manually separate your image out into separate rows um, because with double bed jacquard, we're knitting one color at a time. Uh, but AYAB can do this for you. And we can do up to six colors instead of just two. So let me explain what's going on here. This is the two color example for double bed jacquard. On the left is, sorry, on the right is what we're knitting and on the left is how it gets broken down. The white and black pixels are what's knit on any, any given line and the blue are not knit at all. So breaking this down row by row from the bottom, there's actually a missing zeroth row here because on the way that brother patterning works is on the first pass of the carriage, it just sets up the needles that get knit on the next row. So there's a zero path where nothing gets knit. And then on the way back, you knit the first row. So we pick up white, we knit one empty row and set up the next row. And then we knit the white pixels we need for the first line. And then we pick up black. And we knit the black pixels we need for the first line to fill in the empty spaces. And then we start knitting the second line with the black pixels. And then we can go back and pick up white and so on. And this is the only algorithm we have for two color double bed card because this is as efficient as it gets. This is one to one. So you knit one row on the back bed for every one row on the front bed. Even though the back bed is two passes of the carriage. All right, and I don't have a knit sample for this one because the QR code dress is double bed card, two colors. <laughs> Okay, three colors is where it starts to get interesting. <laughs> this is the most basic algorithm for doing more than two colors. In this algorithm, each row takes two passes of the carriage per color. So if you're doing three colors, it's six passes of the carriage or three rows on the back bed for every one row on the front bed. Um, and broken down, we see we have our zeroth row where we pick up black and we set up the needles. And on the way back, we need our black pixels for row one. And then we pick up red and we knit nothing for the second row. And then we, lit the red, we knit the red pixels for row one. And then we pick up white, and we knit nothing. And then we, put, we knit the white pixels for row one. So this is really inefficient and it's not the best way to do this. Um, and as you can imagine when you get up to six colors, the stretches get pretty stretched out. So here's a sample of this technique, both the front and the back. And this is the texture that you get when you're knitting on every other needle on the bottom bed. And you can see the stitches are pretty stretched out. Okay, so middle colors twice is another algorithm that we have implemented. And this is a little bit more efficient. It is two passes for every, each row is two passes of the carriage for every color minus two. So for three colors, that makes it four instead of six. So breaking this down, um, we pick up black, we knit an empty row, and then we knit the black pixels for row one. We, knit, we pick up white, we knit the, an empty row, 
and then we knit the white pixels for row one, and then we pick up red, and we knit the, on the way forward, we, we knit the pixels for row one, and on the way back, we knit the pixels for row two. And this winds up getting a doubled up row for the end, and the middle gets repeated. Uh, so it's more efficient, but it is a little more tricky to work with because you have to figure out where to repeat your colors correctly. And the software will tell you this, but like double bit your card is hard. Okay, the next algorithm is called Heart of Pluto. Heart of Pluto is an Australian artist who machine knit this star tapestry and then eventually added electronics to it. Um, and she came up with a novel method for doing double bit your card and we have implemented it in AYAB. But just as an aside, she didn't use AYAB to make this. She actually got into her Brother 950 with a floppy drive emulator uh, with a method similar to what is currently being sold as image to track which is another like way to hack knitting machines. Okay, so I just have to first give ma massive props to Adrian, who's a member of the AYAB community, who also has, happens to be the president of my local guild and does most of our software testing as well. She fought to understand what this algorithm actually does and then get it incorporated into the program. Um, so it looks very similar to Middle Color Twice. And actually Middle Color Twice came out of a misunderstanding about how this algorithm works. So I thought that was really cool. All right, so the easiest way to explain this is that on the left to the right pass, we knit the stitches for the row that we're working on. And on the way from the, sorry, I don't, I don't know my left and my right. Left to right, we knit the stitches for the row that we're working on. And then from right to left, if the row hasn't been, if the row hasn't been completed yet, like if all of the colors haven't been knit for that row, we knit an empty pass and we go to the next color. But if it has, we can start on the next row. So looking at this example here, we knit one empty row of white and then the pixels for row one with white and then we pick up red and we knit the pixels for row one with red and because the row hasn't been finished yet, there are still missing pixels, we knit an empty row. And then we pick up black, we knit the pixels for row one with black and then the row has been completed. We've knit all of our colors so we can start on the next row. And then it just con continues up there. We start black and then white, but the row hasn't finished yet. So then we pick up red and we knit red, but the row is finished now, so we can knit the next row for red. And this is essentially middle colors twice with a shifting frame of reference. But with this algorithm, you're knitting the colors in the same order every time. Um, with middle colors twice, let me find it, you don't. So you wind up with like more of one color in the back, and there's more thinking about what color needs to be selected next, and all that happens manually. But this is less thinking. These are all the swatches next to each other. So you can see from left to right, we have um, the classic algorithm that's inefficient and then middle colors twice and then heart of Pluto. So why should you care? <laughs> <laughs> this impacts the gauge of your final knit piece and um, knit stitches are not square. So you need to take into account that aspect ratio when you're designing patterns. You also need to knit at a looser tension on the main bed than on the ribber because you have multiple passes on the ribber that make up an individual row on the front. So your stitches get stretched out. Uh, and if you don't balance it correctly, you wind up with swatches that will curl up. And like, that's great if you're going for that, but if you want something flat, but like a fabric, then you're gonna have problems. Um, and it's really important to keep track of what you're doing and all of your color changes because when you have the machine set up in double bed configuration, you can't see what's going on and the front of the fabric is facing away from you. So if you get off by a color change, it's really hard to know, and it's impossible to recover from. The only way to really know is to like crawl up under your machine and look at the back of the fabric. Um, so less thinking is better. <laughs> if you make mistakes and drop stitches, it's really hard to recover. Um, I have trouble myself when I stop to move weights. I can't remember if I've changed colors already or not. Uh, so there's a moment of panic there, but I did figure out like if you change colors with the carriage on the right side There's no color change over there only on the left. So you don't have to worry about if you've already changed colors uh, The point is there's a lot going on. So less thinking is better at least in my mind So a little bit more about AYAB here at the end We're getting ready to release a new version after like six years <laughs> The new version will have a bunch of bug fixes and UI updates including this like bottom bar that breaks down the pattern and um, garter carriage support and Brother 270 support, which are the my pet projects. 
Uh, we're also working on the next version of the hardware. It's going to be significantly different than what we're doing now. It'll be ESP32 based, so it'll be able to host its own like desktop application. So you can just connect to over Wi-Fi, but that's like probably a year or two out at least. Um, if you want to get involved, come say hi in the Discord. Uh, if you're a code person, if you're not a code person but you still want to help, we've got a beta starting up soon, and we need people to help test and find bugs for the next release so it's nice and stable. Um, and we always need experienced machine knitters to help us improve the documentation and to make sure that like people who want to get started can figure it out. Uh, and then we have a list of resources of things. <laughs> Questions? I know that it was um, started by those two German folks. I'm curious, just like from a personal point of view, how you stumbled across it, um, what it's been like being a steward. Yeah, so I saw like a Hackaday article about Heart of Pluto called like Network Knitting Printer or something uh, because she set up a little Python server and was like sending jobs to the Python server to be knit on her setup because she's like fully automated with a, a motor and everything. And I'm like, I need to figure out how to do this. <laughs> and then I did a bunch of research to find the different ways that you could add electronics to knitting machines and landed on AYAB because it was open source. A lot of the stuff that Heart of Pluto did is not really and not really accessible. Um, and then I did a bunch of research to make sure that I would be able to learn how to machine knit on my own, which I wasn't really sure when I bought my first machine if it would be possible to figure out, <laughs> but luckily it was. And then I started having problems. Uh, I couldn't get my interface set up and I went trying to find help. And then I found out that the project was kind of dead. Like no one was really working on it. They had started a big push to do a rewrite of some of the firmware at the beginning of the pandemic and then lost a bunch of developers and like no one had really touched it in a while. So I just was kind of plugging away, fixing bugs and adding features as I wanted to. And then I started doing YouTube videos and I made one about the garter carriage because I think it's really cool. And it just kind of felt really shitty to be like, look at this cool thing that I did. You can't do it unless you have like all of these specialized skills. Um, and then I realized that like, if I wanted to get it ready for a release, I'd have to prop the community back up. And that's what I had to do. Started a discord, started bringing people in. We have regular developer meetings now and like it's back to a thriving community and we're almost ready for a release. Oh, this all this is so cool. Like I can't, <laughs> I'm like bubbling over with excitement. You are just so cool. This is so cool. AYA being so cool. <laughs> Uh, have you ever found that you've seen a sample uh, IRL that maybe in the store that someone else is wearing that you've been able to deconstruct and figure out the way that that um, bird's eye or jacquard is done and then incorporate that into your AYAB? So like jacquard is not all that interesting. <laughs> Like industrial machines can switch colors on different sides of the bed, so they don't need to do the the algorithmic stuff that we do to make it easier to deal with. So like, no. <laughs> but I like I do enjoy looking at machine produced and like commercially produced sweaters and figuring out how they're made and constructed. The first uh, reverse engineering project I did was the Victorian cycling sweater in the Met with like the big puffy sleeves. It's from the late 1800s and there's like a hand knitting pattern that a bunch of the historical costume community was recreating by hand. But then there was this example in the museum and they were fairly similar. So I had to go back and forth between the hand knitting pattern, which didn't have gauges and didn't have like needle size information. So I just kind of had to eyeball it going based on like how much negative ease would this have, have had given like ideal proportions at the time with padding and corsets and then turn that into a uh, pattern generator, which is up on my website for free. And then I recreated it. What um, machine would you recommend for uh, someone modding their first machine? So whatever you can get your hands on, one that's listed on the list of supported, but if you're looking for something specific, I'd say the 910, because they were produced for a long time, so there are a lot of them out there, and they also have a common hardware fault where the original patterning mechanism, which was a Mylar reader, breaks. So they go for cheaper because people think they don't work anymore, and then you can just take them apart. Will your new release support Windows? 
Yes. <laughs> so the community, the, the user community, <laughs> the user community for AYAB is kind of interesting because it's a bunch of people who bought their machines when they were new and have been machine knitting forever and are very good at the machine knitting part of it. And then there's people like me who are more interested in the electronics and are new to machine knitting. And we're trying to support like both kinds of people. And it's really interesting. I'd like to find a way to like get these people together in a room and have us all share information because the development team right now is mostly a bunch of us new folks. And we have one person who is like an old school machine knitter and people who are old school machine knitters expect things to work a certain way because that's the way the brother worked originally. Well, those of us who are new to this are just kind of doing things intuitively. So they work, the UX is a little bit different than the original machines, but the expectations are different between the two groups. So like Adrian checks us and is like, no, that's gonna cause problems. Or like, have you considered doing it this other way? Sounds like you need to run a conference. Hmm? Sounds like you need to run a conference. That would be interesting. What has it been like to be a YouTuber? Um, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, like I kind of picked this as my subject for YouTube because there was no pressure. There's like no competition in this space. There are a handful of other machine knitters, but nobody's like trying to be the best machine knitter on YouTube. And nobody's like a big creator with a million followers. So it was like a safe way for me to learn how to edit videos and to make videos and to do all of the marketing and the SEO and the 12 other things that come along with having a YouTube channel. But now that I have it, I find it opens doors for me and gives me opportunities that I would not have had before. I've met so many interesting people and been able to do stuff like this. Hanging on to that, I'll say Carson's YouTube videos are particularly great because um, a lot of other machine knitter YouTubers don't necessarily know about the lighting and <laughs> not to follow their own, yes. but it is really <laughs> difficult to follow and see what they're doing. Yes. Christmas videos are very clear. So I get a lot of in-depth analytics from Google about what's going on on my YouTube channel, and I'd say about half of my viewers are women over 50. So when I saw that, I'm like, okay, I need to put more effort into lighting and sound so that like you can hear what's going on and you can easily see what's going on. Accessibility. Yes. <laughs> Where uh, geographically are most of the team based? We're all over the place. So we still have the two original engineers in Germany. And then I'm in Northern California, and so is Adrian, who fought for uh, Heart of Pluto. Um, and then our hardware guy is down near LA. We've got a, an eng manager in New York who's like herding the cats for all of the meetings and the documentation. Have all you guys met in person yet? Some of us have. So, uh, the eng manager and our hardware guy came to Northern California with us for open source, and we ran a booth for a couple days, and it was amazing. What is open source? Open source is a, a convention run by William Osman, who's like a, an electrical engineer YouTuber who makes bad decisions. Um, <laughs> that's like his whole channel, <laughs> but he's he's pretty big and he's pretty popular, and it's like VidCon meets Mager Fair. We have like a heavy engineering bent, but it's like. Because it's run by this one guy and he's never really run a convention before, it's very like engineering YouTuber focused. So I really want to try to bring more textiles into that. Like they, I think they really need a fashion show, but they don't have that. Have you met any of the people who view your YouTube channel regularly? Yes, the, um, they come to meetups in the Bay Area. <laughs> and I gave a talk at my local guild and a lot of them had seen my videos before. What do you think is like the end goal for AYFU? Like what do you think is like, the one thing you would like to accomplish in That's a good question. I would just like to make machine knitting more accessible and like bring textiles into engineering spaces because engineers do not know their history, as I have been complaining about all week. Um, but just like use it as a way to get more people involved. Have you done any videos on refurbishing? On what? On refurbishing where like or like how to clean? I've done a couple. Um, I, whenever I get a new machine, I usually do a video on replacing the sponge bar. And I have two machines I'm in the process of refurbishing now. I've got an antique from the 1930s. That's been an interesting process. And then I just picked up a, an E6000 that's in really bad shape. And it's probably gonna need a lot of electrical work. So we have a word 
in the studio. I believe it's Lynn's, right? That's your machine. And like for folks who want to play with it, if they haven't already, what uh, sort of state is that? You mentioned it's, it's older version, right? Uh, yeah, but it still works fine. Like it's perfect for this. Um, if anybody wants help getting set up, let me know. You don't have to do double budget card. Like you can just do plain old Fair Isle or Lace or something. That's so cool. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, do you order from the board at the at the website, right? No. So they're only sold by third parties. There is a seller on Etsy called Red Pink Green that sells kits that you can assemble, or you can email Jens, and he will send you one from Germany. Wait, where's oh inner J? Yeah, J Hyde. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hit hire like an AYAB interface and he's gonna ask you like where it needs to be shipped to. <laughs> I'm sending him business. I get no kickbacks from this. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carson.